The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, In a short time you will no longer see me, and then a short time later you will see me again. Then some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean in a short time you will no longer see me, and then in a short time you will see me again? And I am going to the Father, What is this short time? We don't know what he means. And Jesus knew that they wanted to question him. So he said, You are asking me, one another, what I meant by saying, In a short time you will no longer see me, and then in a short time later you will see me again. I tell you most solemnly, you will be weeping and wailing, while the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. The Gospel of the Lord. Here, Jesus dives down into the next day. The next day when he will be completely humiliated, when he'll be stripped when he will be put onto the cross, when he'll be taken from them, and, and when they will not know what to do anymore. So he, he's now preparing them in, in the most direct way for what is going to happen. So that when it happens, they will not be left without something to hold to. So in a short time you will no longer see me, and then in a short time you will see me again. What is this short time? The Jews had no concept of a personal resurrection, no concept of an immediate resurrection from the dead. The concept of the resurrection was that at the end of all things, God will raise all up together. And so the notion that somebody could be raised from the dead in this immediate time frame of a couple days, that wasn't part of their consciousness at all. But Jesus is speaking to them. In a short time, you will no longer see me. What is he referring to? He is referring to the brutal events that will take place over the next while. In a short time, you will no longer see me. He says, you will be, I tell you solemnly, you will be weeping and wailing while the world will rejoice. He's preparing them for what is going to happen. He's preparing us for what is going to happen. How did the disciples deal with that short time? Well, at the end of the crucifixion, and and it was a terrible event, as we all know, at the end of that moment of the crucifixion, the dead body of Jesus comes down and is laid in the arms of his mother. And she, in that scene, the Pieta that we would all be so familiar with. She holds this this dead body. Now, I I want you to understand the drama in that scene. Because Mary has in the back of her mind an angel that said to her that she was to conceive and bear a son and he must be named Jesus. She has in the back of her mind this angel And all that the angel said, and the promise that this one would be, as Simeon would say, for the rising and the falling of the whole of Israel. She has in the back of her mind all that happened in the infancy and the incredible events that took place at the birth with the Magi coming and the shepherds coming and the angels that told the shepherds and and, and, and this whole scene laid before her mind because how do you get a scene like that out of your mind? And yet, she's holding this dead body. She's holding this dead body. This dead body that is bloodied by crucifixion, by the worst torment and torture that the world could ever inflict upon another human being. She's holding this dead body. In a short while, you will not see me. In a short while, you will not see me. This is coded for the, for the crucifixion. And, and so she is, she is holding the dead body and at the same time remembering the angel 
remembering Simeon, remembering Anna, remembering all the events, remembering Elizabeth and, and, and her, her, her prophecy, and, and, and remembering the Magnificat and, and that joy, and, and asking herself, how is it possible? How is it possible that, that that could be true and this could be true? How could that be possible? You will be weeping and wailing while the world will rejoice. And the disciples and Mary are weeping and wailing. And, 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 and the, the, the depth of the, of the horror is, is not simply that Jesus has been crucified. The depth of the horror is how do you put together what God had promised and what you now are living through. That's the depth of the horror. How is it possible that this loving God could allow this to happen to this man who we know is his son? And Mary, above everyone else, would have known. What the disciples hoped for and had faith in, Mary knew from, from, from the birth because she knew what happened to her. She knew what happened when the Spirit came upon her. She knew what happened when the angels spoke to her. She alone could know completely what the truth of this child is because she alone could know completely how this child was conceived. And yet she's holding this dead body and she's weeping and she's wailing and she's asking, how is it possible? And the real horror of the scene is not in the brutality of, the, of the, the body that she holds, but is in the tear in her heart and the sword that pierces her own soul too. Because her soul is pierced because how do you believe in a God who made these promises to you? And at the same time, hold this dead body. How do you do that? How do you hold this together? How do, you, how, do you, how do you reconcile these complete opposites? But isn't that true for our spiritual life? That many times in our life we are in that Peter scene with Mary that, that we remember the promises that God has made to us and, and still we, we're faced with the sheer horror of his absence, the sheer horror of, 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 of the sufferings of people, the sheer horror of a COVID-19 the sheer horror of, of, of a world plunged into darkness, the sheer horror of a nation shut down and, and the number of people who are in d distress and, and desolate, that, that, that we, like Mary, have, have to hold the impossible, the, the, the promise of God and, and, and the death and destruction that is in, in front of us. And, and that Pieta scene is, is, is a scene that helps us to understand in this short time you will no longer see me. And in a short time again, I will see you again. But while, the world, while you will be weeping and wailing, the world will rejoice. Because those who conspired to crucify him, who conjured up false evidence against him, went home that day feeling at right with God because it is better that one man suffer than the whole nation perish. And they told themselves whatever they told themselves that they had done a righteous deed and a good deed that day. And they had convinced themselves of the righteousness of their actions in putting this one to death because of what could have happened with Rome and with, with the occupation if he had not been put to death, if they didn't find a solution for him. And they would have rationalized all of their rationality. And yet Mary is holding a dead body with blood all over her, all over her smeared with blood and weeping and weeping and wailing because how could they do this to her beautiful boy? How could they do this to her son? How could they do this to Abba's child? How could they do this? How is it possible that the human heart could sink to such brutality? But isn't that what we do when we have to hold a migrant, when we have to hold a refugee? Isn't that what we do when we have to hold the, the victim of abuse? Isn't that what we do when we have to hold the many, many people, 20 something million people that are thrown into, into slavery and, and, and thrown into human trafficking? Isn't that what we have to do when we hold the creation and we see the, the results of our own effort 
in, in bringing such destruction to the creation? Do we not too have to contemplate this mystery of the Pieta, the death and the destruction at the hands of humans and the promise of God and, and, and the irreconcilable way in which these two are held together? But isn't that what spirituality is about? And isn't that what God has plunged us into in this time? As we hear this text, in a little while you'll see me not, and in a little while you'll see me again. I, I, I want you to hear the, the contradiction and paradox of faith. And that's what Jesus is putting be, before the disciples today, the contradiction and the paradox of faith. Faith is only faith when you push to the limits and to the edge. If you're in a place of great knowledge and great consolation, you don't need faith. You need faith when you push to the limits, when you push to the edge, when you can no longer see your way, when it does not make sense anymore, when nothing in your framework makes any sense to interpret what you're living through. That's when faith begins. We want a cheap grace, an easy faith, a warm weather Christianity. And what Jesus is saying to us today in our text is that, that, that grace... And faith has an incredible cost. That price is the price of his son, Jesus Christ. And, and, and plunged into this deep darkness, Mary and the disciples wept with bitterness for what they saw and what they beheld. But the text is true because on the third day, when he rose from the dead, they rejoiced with incredible elation as they understood the full mystery of what has been revealed. That's what we have to remember, that the weeping and the destruction and, and the violence of humanity and, it's, and, and what it brings will never be the final say, will never be the last word. It will never be the end of the story. The story, when it seems to end, always breaks forth with a new light. And your hearts will rejoice. Your hearts will rejoice. And when that day comes, you will not ask me any questions. And that joy, no one shall take from you. That joy, no one shall take from you. As we come to this moment in the upper room where our text leads us to this image of the Piet and the, the, the wailing and the, the suffering of the disciple, let us not forget the text also takes us to the joy and the elation of the resurrection. Amen.